Sorry, I think the Zoom on your end is muted. Do you mind unmuting it? Huh. Should I repeat some of the things? <laughs> Go on. All right. So <laughs> how they form, because if they don't form, they're not going to be there. Um, how they burp away the surroundings, uh, because that's actually galactic and feedback, and a lot of people care about it. Um, we care about this not only in context of galaxies, but in the context of stars, which get exploded by, by jets. Um, we can ask some really interesting and cute questions. Uh, what if the black hole that's sitting right there at the center and receiving this harassed mass energy at the rate m dot c squared, where m dot is number of grams per second accretion rate, multiplied by c squared gives you e dot, the energy equal to mc squared, as Einstein said. Uh, so what if this supply of mass is tilted relative to the black hole? We don't expect the, the gas from large distances to know which way the black hole rotational axis points Will this mess things up and how? Uh, will these jets still continue to fly out along the black hole rotational axis, which here it was aligned with the spin axis, or will it go along the black hole in some other direction? Sorry, along the disk in some other direction, or maybe the jets won't be there at all, and that's a big deal. Then the jets are not there. Um, so how do we get feedback? Um, and of course, there are important questions because we see black holes through radiation. And it's very hard to take into account the effect of radiation on the flow itself. So how does radiation affect the flow itself and everything that comes with it? Uh, and finally, a really nice cherry on top is, can jets power gravitational waves? So that's the kind of outline of the talk. It's meant to be highly interactive, lots of fun. I don't see any popcorn, although I politely requested that people are free to come with popcorn. So in any case, I'll try to work in this sort of uh, non popcorn atmosphere and try to get excited. So, uh, agent feedback. Yes. Can I ask what the coils in the jet represent? Ah, the coils in the jet. So, I will talk about this more, but this is a great question. Coils in the jet, this is the wound up magnetic field lines by the black hole. So, black hole gobbles up the magnetic field lines like spaghetti. It's dangling out of black hole's mouth. Okay, sorry, I'm switching <laughs> off the five year old version. Uh, so, black hole coils up the magnetic field lines because it rotates, drags the space time around. Uh, and basically you get a magnetic spring that is expanding as fast as it's being wrapped up at the bottom. And that's kind of the equilibrium twist of the black hole field lines. And uh, I will show more um, kind of a diagram of how that works in, in just a moment. Any other questions? Please keep them coming. Okay, hello. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay. Now, um, AGN feedback uh, cares a lot about jets. So what is AGN feedback? So we have uh, an X-ray image of uh, a, a center of a galaxy cluster. This is the Perseus cluster. And uh, there is a bright dot over here. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that dot, there is a supermassive black hole. And you can see that there are kind of bubble looking like an hourglass shaped structure which are the bubbles that are presumably inflated by the activity of the black hole. Perhaps these jets are what's doing the work. Um, there are kind of features that look like maybe they are shocks. And indeed, if you sharpen this image, you will see that, yes, here they are, the bubbles. 
There are the sort of structures that could be shocks, or sound waves, or some other waves that perhaps are carrying this energy away from the center, maybe depositing it in the MB medium and heating it up. Does, does this particular cluster have a radio jet? Um, there is a jet at the center, yes, the center. and it's exactly wobbling on the scale of maybe 10 years. So it changed direction in the last 10 years. So it's an active system. It's doing something interesting. Uh, and we are trying to understand what it is. You mean it's changed direction while we've been observing? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we might have missed the moment when it changed direction. Mm -hmm. I think the observations 10 years ago and very recently, and uh, bingo, it's going in a completely different direction mm -hmm. right now than 10 years ago. Uh, this is a very, um, uh, very well known uh, system. So there's a lot of observations both in X ray and the radio and other uh, wavelengths as well. This is another really exciting uh, system, M87. Uh, I will talk more about it later. Uh, suffice it to say that there is, again, sort of cavities inflated by the jets, which are these sort of things which don't have to go in a straight line. And there are also shocks and so on and so forth. Yes, please go. Why are both jets bright? I shouldn't want to be. Ah, that is a really good question. So I'll talk about it later. Shoo, I hope. Uh, these are jets on really, really large scales, like two uh, arc minutes. Uh, so these are, I think, like maybe a galaxy scale size things. So uh, these are like maybe 10 kiloparsecs, something like this. I could be wrong. If there's an observer in the room, tell me how big it is. So the famous images of M87 were like 100 megaparsecs across. But, you know what? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I mean, getting confused which scale it is. Uh, I'm that's embarrassed. depends on which. You know, the ones with the giant, giant. Yeah, pearls. I think this is a bit smaller scale, somewhere in between those giant scales and smaller and very small scales. But basically, at these scales, things are going very slowly compared to the speed of light. So, so the reason, of, yeah, exactly. It's, it's not even a jet anymore. It's sort of a plume that the jet became. Yeah. This is hundreds of KPC, right? Hundreds yeah, of KPC. Yeah, I think I was okay. getting a parsec for the big radio loads. Yeah, I'll show you the structure on a few KPC. So, that actually makes sense. But, but this case, isn't the central, like there is a central radio jet, which so is on a The center is somewhere over yeah. there. It's yeah. high in the very, very center. Yeah. And, and so, when they zoom in on that, indeed, you only see one jet. You only see one show you side that. of it. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 But you get exactly. it to the center. But the point is, uh, these things are injecting energy into the environment. And uh, this is another example where this is definitely hundreds uh, of KPC and in fact could be a thousand KPC across uh, from one end to the other. Uh, this is uh, the sort of central cluster galaxy of uh, cluster M0735.6. And the thing is here that um, blue shows X-ray emission. So it's thermal gas, it's really hot. And purple shows radio emission, synchrotron emission from electrons which are moving really fast on the magnetic field line that were injected by the central uh, engine, the black hole presumably, um, and so you can see where you have purple, you don't see that much blue. So these jets, they are actually displacing the blue thermal gas, and they need to do work to do that. They actually have to inflate. Like if you take a balloon and push the air into it, I get out of breath because I actually do work, PDV work. And here, the same sort of uh, estimate of energy contained within these uh, bubbles can be performed. And you can find that the energy contained within these bubbles is comparable to the entire rotational energy of the black hole, which is huge. Could be you know, up to a third of mc squared of the black hole. So there has to be a way uh, for the black hole to convert its rotational energy so efficiently into these collimated outflows. And spoiler alert, I will argue that this can be done by large scale magnetic fields. Uh, another way of looking at this interaction between the black hole and the environment is to plot the mass of the black hole that goes from a million black uh, solar radii, sorry, a million solar masses to uh, about uh, 10 billion at the top of this vertical axis. And we will plot this relative to uh, the velocity dispersion in the central part of the galaxy, uh, velocity dispersion of the stars uh, in the bulge. And the velocity goes from 60 to 400 kilometers per second, just to give you the sense of scale if you can't see from behind. So you see that there is a tight correlation between the mass of the central black hole and the sort of velocity dispersion, sort of the temperature of the stars in the sort of central part of the galaxy. 
and this is known as the m sigma relation. This is mass and this is sigma, the dispersion. And you would say, okay, that makes sense because these stars, they feel the mass of the black hole, the bigger the mass, the hotter the stars. But actually the mass of the black hole is uh, one one thousandth of the mass of the central part of the galaxy. So these stars, they don't care about the black hole. It's, it's a tiny compared to the mass of the, uh, of the rest um of the material so these stars don't directly feel the mass of the black hole so the only way for them to know about each other and they clearly do uh is to somehow talk to each other perhaps through maybe jet or radiative feedback of the black hole if the black hole grows too big the jets or radiation switches on and uh, stops star formation or perhaps there is some sort of co-evolution going on where the black hole and the stars are controlled by the same process and that's how they know about each other Another way of quantitatively looking at the black hole or ABN feedback is to plot the radio luminosity um, of the uh, core emission that comes from the central region plus extended emission, which comes from the jets, um, versus the optical or nuclear B band luminosity, which probably comes from the gas that's been gobbled up by the black hole. So, this radio emission is typically thought of being as a proxy for the jet power. And this horizontal axis is thought to be a proxy for the accretion rate onto the black hole. Um, and you can clearly see that there are two tracks on this plot. The radio loud upper track is about a thousand times more powerful, so that there is about three orders of magnitude uh, in radio luminosity than the radio quiet track for the same X value. And because X value is the accretion rate, it means for the same mass accretion rate, there's got to be something um, in addition to the mass of the black hole, which is within a factor of few between these two tracks and the mass accretion rate. There has to be something else that's telling the, the galaxy whether to land on the radio loud or the radio quiet track. So what is that extra parameter or a set of parameters? Could it be a magnetic flux? Remember that question about magnetic field lines that were twisted? If magnetic fields are stronger, perhaps the jets are stronger. And therefore, then uh, the galaxy can land on the radio loud track. Perhaps it's the differences with the ambient medium where I can argue either way. Uh, if there is no ambient medium, the jets just fly out, don't radiate too much, we don't see them. If there is a lot, then the jets maybe struggle, and then uh, there is a lot of fireworks, and you see a lot uh, of emission. Or maybe if there is way too much medium, the jets just don't, don't propagate anywhere, fall apart at such a small scale, you don't see the emission. So, Maybe ambient medium is an important role here. But none of these explanations uh, accounts for the gap. I would expect any of those to be continuous. Ah, that's a really good point, and Andre. Uh, it's so good to have you. <laughs> I, I would, I'm, I'm excited to, to talk to you later. Hopefully, uh, we have a chance to, uh, to discuss. I, I, really, I really agree with this. I mean, the gap is the big problem. So we would have to have magnetic flux somehow decide to either be at the maximum or at the minimum and maybe that's how you go between the two or maybe there is a switch maybe below a certain magnetic flux the jets can go and above they can and so that's what can determine this so there is a lot of nuance to this um with a black hole spin you would have to come up with a way of separating things out again maybe there is a switch maybe there's a critical spin above which the jets can survive and below which they, they can or maybe there is something physical that can tell us that the black holes either have the maximum or zero spin and nothing in between, which maybe is a surprise. But actually, there could be a physical reason for why this can happen. But I will provide another explanation for this. Maybe this is a selection effect. Because you see each of these, like you have the up, upside down triangles, there are circles, there are uh, crosses, there are stars. All of these are coming from different data sets. And so it's possible that the way we pick a data set biases us either towards very radio bright or very radio quiet sources. So maybe this is just a selection effect and there's actually a continuous range. But even if there's a continuous range, it would be good to understand what is the parameter that tells us how high or low we are. Um, are you going to talk about the core dominated versus jet dominated distinction? Not so too much. from this perspective, it, you don't really care whether the radio is coming from the core or the jets. It's just there's radio. I, from this, yes, but of course, in order to dig any deeper, yeah. I would like to know this. And it seems like um, 
But so, I'm kind of wondering on Radio Loud, are some yeah. of those core dominated and some jet dominated? Yes, Radio Loud all... is mostly like the, the jet is the one that brings you out to be Radio Loud. Um, having said that, yes, and the cores are actually pretty similar, especially if you correct for logistic beaming. So this is really about whether there are big jets. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not black and white like I made it to be, but it, it, it seems to be related to the large scale uh, structure of the system. So it seems like these guys actually do have the jets that get out very far. And these guys, uh, they seem to have still have the jets, at least some of them, but they are kind of really struggling and they barely get out of what we call the radio core, which is kind of Got it. yeah. I'm uh, really happy to talk about this. I have been working really hard to try and understand this, so any ideas at all? Any other questions? All right, so uh, here is the one-sided jet of M87, as, as requested. Uh, so if we look at M87 at much smaller scales than before, so before we decided it was 100 kiloparsecs, so this is uh, 3,000 light years, so one parsec is about uh, three light years, so this is about one kiloparsec in projection. So this jet actually, uh, the physical length of the jet is maybe five kiloparsecs or so. Um, so that's a black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy of a mass of about 10 billion solar masses. And you can see that there is only one jet. The other one is probably still there. It's just, it's pointing at aliens. So its emission is Doppler boosted towards aliens or away from us, so it's Doppler G boosted. So we don't see much emission at all. This one is coming within uh, about 20 degrees away from our line of sight, and uh, Doppler boosting makes it appear much brighter than it otherwise would be. Um, so this jet is invisible, but we see its effect on the MB medium, similar to the one that's pointing at us. So once the jet rams into the MB medium, falls apart, as you can see it's doing here, slows down, uh, and kind of makes it into swoosh. Uh, the swoosh, the sort of uh, slower moving material, of the ambient medium seems to be rather symmetric on both sides. So that's what we think is going on. We have a jet that moves at a Lorentz factor of about six, at least these are the proper motions detected down there, uh, and that is enough to explain the Doppler boosting. Are there any questions about this? Um, and there is another galaxy uh, that's also one of my favorites. Uh, this one is Cygnus A galaxy, where you see that, uh, well, there is a black hole there. It's also about 10 billion solar masses. You can actually see the black hole. You see kind of a bright dot. But the two jets, they seem to be much more stable. Unlike this jet that's falling apart, this one goes out to much larger scale. So this is 70 kiloparsecs in length. This is about 5 kiloparsecs deprojected. And you see that this jet goes all the way up to the hotspot where it hits the ambient medium. And like if you take a garden hose directed at the wall, the water will splash back. So that is the splash back. That's the backflow as it's called. So the material goes out, it's the hot spot, uh, comes back. Uh, here, things seem to be rather different. The flow goes out and this sort of uh, exhaust of the jet actually manages to outrun the jet itself. It's as if you are taking a car and you're backing up so slowly that the exhaust out of the tailpipe is outrunning the car itself. That's kind of what we have here. And here we have a sort of much faster motion where there is a backflow, so exhaust comes back. So why? I mean, I would have thought that all the galaxies should look the same, but these two look very different. I mean, that's really, uh, I don't know, disappointing or maybe exciting, depending on your perspective, because it looks like there are two classes. And so this is known as an FR1, FR2 dichotomy when are really type one, type two. These ones are type ones. They typically are a bit weaker in power or quite a bit weaker than FR2s. Maybe the power is the difference that makes this jet appear um, different, meaning it's in the central engine. Maybe it's an MBA medium that is different between these two galaxies. Maybe it's a combination of both. Uh, it's been debated since 1974, and I will show you some of the possible answers. Just but the, yeah. just the inferred Lorentz factor for us to consider. Uh, it's pretty hard to tell here because it's not pointing towards us, and it's also unclear what we are looking at. Maybe it's not the relativistic part we are looking at. Maybe it's the sheet that moves slower. Um, I I presume that it's still relativistic. It's just we don't see it. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there is a very good constraint here on the motion. Any other questions? 
Okay, so what we would like to get out of these images is some sort of understanding of how this whole system works. But so far, I'm convincing you, I think, is that we, the more we look, the less we understand. But what if we were to zoom into the very center? I, I, I do have a question. Yes. You have these PJ numbers. Yeah. Which are, are these, how are these related to the radioluminosity? So radioluminosity is, is typically a tiny fraction of the actual jet power because there is only small efficiency with which uh, the jet power gets distributed across the multi-wave emission spectrum and radio is just one tiny fraction of that. And, you ask, and these PJs come from? Uh, various ways of estimating the power. For instance, here, uh, you can look at the sort of energetics that's needed to affect the, like, cause the effect that we see in the main medium. There are some hot spots that people are trying to infer the jet power from. So these are the sorts of ways that people, there are like 10 different ways, uh, and 100 different. Generally not from the radio no. light alone. Um, so what people, do sometimes they they plot for a bunch of galaxies radial luminosity versus the inferred jet power and there is a correlation so right. sometimes you can look at just the total radio power and say well uh maybe i can read off from this correlation what the actual physical power is but in this case this is uh, such a well-known source that a lot of people actually have done measurements specifically to try to figure out what the power is and when i say 10 to the 44 uh more likely it's like anywhere between 10 to the 43 and 10 to the 45. So it's it's really uncertain. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right, so what I am inviting you to do is to imagine what if we could zoom in. So we already have a zoom in by a factor of uh, 3,000 from 3,000 light years to one light year, and that's just a thousand black hole radius. So we're really getting down close to the black hole. So the black hole is hiding somewhere here, immediately to the left of this core emission. Um, and you can see that there is pattern moving to the right, and the person who made it, uh, Craig Walker, he actually claims that in order to test scientifically whether the pattern is actually moving to the right, he uh, played the movie backwards and asked his wife to tell him which way <laughs> the ripples are going, and she said to the left. So <laughs> it's clear that it's clear. indeed there is motion from the center to the right, so away from the black hole. So what we think is going on is that these jets start very slow near the black hole, and as they go out and they expand sideways, then they accelerate. Now we'll talk to you about how that acceleration works with it. But before I do that, let's try and see, what if we were to look even deeper? Maybe we could make an image of the black hole shadow itself. Maybe we could learn about the properties of the black hole, the spin, um, the magnetic field strength, whatever else, and that will answer a lot of questions. Um, so this actually what has been done for two black holes, our largest black hole with angular size in the sky. Uh, so, but for that, in order to see the structure of the event horizon scale, you need to have a telescope the size of the Earth. It's literally ridiculous. But scientists have been working on this for a long time, and they figured out that they can effectively get that size of the dish from the point of view of angular resolution um, by scattering radio dishes throughout the globe and making them into an interferometer. So. It's now the distance between the dishes that is the baseline of the interferometer that allows you, that limits the, re the angular resolution. So uh, this is a sort of so-called UV plane of the Fourier transform of the actual radio image. And uh, each pair of these telescopes as the Earth rotates uh, underneath the sky uh, traces out an arc on the UV plane. Uh, and uh, the more telescopes you add to the array, and these are all of the names of the telescopes, like ALMA is in, in Chile over here, and so on and so forth, the more, the larger fraction of the, of the Fourier space of the UV plane you cover with this trash, and the more information on more scales you get in the image. And you can make something that looks like this. This is the most advanced simulation by the code called Interstellar of a in Cretan black hole. Unfortunately, the code they used over there ignored a few physical effects, including the Doppler effect. That's why the left and the right side of the disk look the same. But if the disk rotates towards you on this side, the side should be much brighter than on the other side. Okay, but we actually don't have to guess. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope actually made the photograph of this, and you probably saw this, so I'm sorry for making it dramatic. You saw it probably many times. Um, so we have four frames in the movie on April 5th, 6th, 10th, and 11th of year 2017. 
And what we can see is the sort of lensed emission of stuff around the black hole. What we're looking at is basically the Einstein ring uh, stuff. Uh, that, that's the result of black hole uh, lensing light around it. And the size of this ring is really important because it tells us basically pretty much about the mass of the black hole. So the bigger the black hole, the bigger is the size of the ring. And from that, we can read off the mass of the black hole, which is 6.5 billion solar masses. And that actually settled the debate, whether it was three or six billion, there were two different ways of measuring the black hole mass. That was, was one of the important results, directly measure the mass of the black hole, or the black hole. And the other cool thing is you see that the bottom is brighter than the top. Doppler effect. So it means that the bottom is rotating towards us and the top is moving away from us. If we add the large scale jet and assume that that's the axis of rotation, which it doesn't have to be, but let's assume that for a second, then it means that the rotation has to happen like this. The jet is pointing at us, so the bottom has to rotate towards us. So the rotation of the sky has to be clockwise. So that is amazing. So just from this image, we can tell, we don't know how fast the black hole rotates, but we know which way it rotates. We know which way the axis of rotation. In the case of uh, this, um, our own Sagittarius A star, we had a guy from the Savannah Horizon Telescope yes. and he said that the structure that we see in the sky obviously must have been averaged by motions for our own black hole. And he said this structure is just due to bad UV coverage. And in this case, it is different or? So um, there is a big difference. So I think I know uh, the sort of this, the backstory. The backstory is that the time scale of the Sagittarius A star, dynamical mm -hmm. time scale, uh, is much shorter than in the Medes. And yet you have seen some structure which you should not have seen. And the guy said it was because of this uh, you incomplete UV coverage and the structure is not real. But in this case, you are saying the structure is real. So let's talk about offline because I would like to know more. I personally haven't heard about large scale problems in imaging of Sagittarius A star. They worked really hard and teams of hundreds of people to try and uh, deal with the time variability. Here, the issue of time variability is not a problem. Right. And what is the issue of time variability? Is while you take an exposure, the system has changed because the changes on the time scale that's shorter than the exposure. So you take in a photograph uh, of, let's say, a waterfall with a long exposure of 10 minutes, you will wash out all the small scale structure and you would say, ah, that's not a big deal. But see, here, you're taking exposure in the UV plane. So you have averaged the Fourier transform, and if you transform back to the real image, what do you even get? So that's what people actually, it took them, I don't know, I think it two years, I think, uh, since the time they published these images for M87 to publish images for Sagittarius A star, which is 1,000 times smaller black hole, and therefore all the time scales are 1,000 times shorter, and that's the problem. Here, there is no worry. In 30 seconds, nothing changes, but on a day-to-day -day scale, you saw that there were some differences. Uh, like, if you go between April 5 to April 11, there, there are some differences, although it could be just noise, could be just errors in the um, in, in just the data processing. But the cool thing is that what's robust here is this asymmetry in the image, and that they think is real. Um, and uh, furthermore, what they were able to do, they were able to measure polarization of this image, which tells us something about the structure of large-scale magnetic field. And what this told them is that the structure is dominated, although it looks as a neutral, it actually turns out counterintuitively that the original structure that gave rise to this image, uh, to the structure in the image, uh, the magnetic field must have been radial. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. And that's really important because this structure means that black hole is probably featuring really strong dynamically inborn magnetic fields. Um, in fact, they are probably as strong as possible. Basically, you take the black hole and stop it with as much of magnetic field until the magnetic field becomes so strong, it can push the gas away against gravity. And that's what we call the mad state of accretion. I happen to be the first one to simulate it a long time ago. Now I think it has 800 citations. Uh, so that's really helpful, hopefully, for my tenure piece. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the other really important thing uh, is that observations like this have revealed that only about one part out of a hundred of the gas on large scales around the black hole actually make it to the center. Where does the 99% of the rest of the gas go? Probably in an outflow, but why? 
What determines this 1%? Is it a fundamental number? What does it depend on? It's, it's an open, open question. And it's really important because in cosmological simulations, you would like to know, as you simulate large scales, what happens on, long, on small scales, you simply cannot reach those within the simulation. Um, and you have to use models that connect large scales to small scales. And this 1% number would be really good to firm up with some uh, robust data. And I'm actually enjoying myself too much and going pretty slow. So let me <laughs> show you some of the actual results. I'll probably show you just a couple. OK, so um, by popular demand, uh, here is how the jets work. So I will throw away the black hole and just replace it with a disco ball. Disco ball is highly uh, conductive. So it means that if I insert a magnetic field line into a disco ball and spin it up, the foot point of the field line will have to rotate together with the disco ball. I will take the field line and attach it by the other end to the ceiling, uh, which will represent the ambient medium. And the ceiling will also be highly magnetized like the plasma in astrophysics is. And so it means that this field line on the other end is also attached. So let's wait for n rotations of our disco ball or the central object. And what we'll have is we will wrap up the initially vertical field line in the n loops, a one loop per rotation. And what we've gotten here is a magnetic spring. The black hole has done work on twisting the magnetic field line into a spring. There is pressure that's trying to push the ceiling away. And eventually the ceiling gives in, the spring starts to expand under its own pressure and accelerate. And so this is the jet. You can think of the jet as um, transform uh, the black hole rotation transforming these vertical field lines through rotation into toroidal hoops that fly out along the original field line as, a, as they do they expand sideways the pressure drops and the pressure gradient pushes them up so this is the physics of these magnetically uh, driven jets and what i'm going to do now is i'm kind of going to really quickly go over the two-dimensional uh, diet space of black holes. So on the vertical axis will be the thickness of the friction disk, and on the horizontal axis will be the vertical field strength. So let me talk about the field strength. If we have lots of vertical field, that's the field that we need to give the black hole for it to wind it up into the tower, into the magnetic spring. So if we have lots of it, it's good for jets. If we have no vertical field, bad for jets. But presume there will be no jets to the left, we will have a lot of jets to the right. And this vertical axis is also important. Think about our um, disc as a slab of cheese and uh, this vertical field lines as a cheese cutter. You have a really thick cheese slab, it would be pretty hard to cut it. But if you have a cheese slice, it would be very easy to cut through. So if we have a thick disc, then the magnetic field lines will have a hard time escaping the central region. And maybe they will be like, more likely to hold the magnetic fields in place and therefore produce powerful jets. Why but, is it the thickness instead of like, I don't know, the dense, like the total mass in the disk? Um, so um, I guess the thickness, if you have something that's really thick, it's very hard for the field lines to reconnect across the disk. There's actually a physical obstacle uh, that's, uh, that's separating the two field lines with opposite orientations. If something is thin, uh, the time scale to diffuse becomes shorter and the time scale to fall in. The other thing that I didn't mention is that the thinner the disk, the more time it spends going around in a circle instead of going inwards. And thick disks, they kind of quasi spherical, they fall in faster. So that makes the time scale to infall even shorter. And so everything works uh, against the jets when the disks are thin and no vertical flux. So this is the hardest for jets. That is the easiest, and these two up for grabs. Okay? So, uh, I'm at 40 minutes. How many more minutes can I talk before you get up and go? We'll get up and go at about 3 o'clock. OK, cool. So, so I actually <laughs> can cover quite a bit. All right, so uh, this part. We won't literally get up and go. It'll all be very polite. I will work really hard so that you will be very, well, anyway, I'll try to finish in time. So this part we already saw. I saw you the images of jets. That's that's what everyone has been able to obtain. Vertical field, thick disk, no problem. Let's try something more challenging. And you will tell me, Sasha, look, you already solved the problem. The jets are there. What do you want? Like, wait, only 10% of active galaxies produce a powerful jet. 90% don't. So this actually is a small fraction of what 
of the of the actual sources. So what happens in 90%? How do we shut these jets off? That is actually what I'm going to try and figure out. So let's try this part. We will take away the vertical magnetic flux and we will give it instead a horizontal flux or as a mutual flux. Magnetic flux comes out here, goes down there. So this is a simulation that tries to do that. So let me kind of introduce you to this way of showing things. There will be a few more of these. So this is a zoom in on the central part over here. It's a vertical slice uh, through a box of about 100 times 100 gravitational radii of the black hole on the side. Here is the black hole about 1 times 1 gravitational radius on the side. Uh, and you can see the black hole in the center. Color here shows density, or rather log of density. Uh, red is 100, so log is equal to 2. And blue is like 10 to minus 8, so it's tiny. Um, the black hole spin is vertical. Uh, there is no vertical magnetic flux, so it's all as a mutual. And the thickness of the disk is about one third, so it's about order unity, so it's a pretty thick disk. You see, this is the disk, it's going around, and that's the hole in the disk. Okay? So we're looking at the vertical slice, we see the meat in the disk. So let's uh, run the simulation and, and see what happens, because we don't expect any jets. Okay? So I'm going to go for a walk, and you will tell me what happens. I'm not looking, not looking, not looking. Hey! What's happening? We start without any magnetic field lines in this plane, and now you see this black solid and dashed field lines. They're showing magnetic loops that are actually in this vertical plane. The vertical field is there. It wasn't there before. What we've seen for the first time is the action of the large scale so called poloidal magnetic flux dynamo in a black hole accretion simulation. Just like in the sun, the polarity of dipolar field changes once every 11 years. So it must be dynamo that generates this poloidal flux. And here we've seen something similar. In fact, a bunch of people in my group have been trying to understand what it is. Although you have a simulation, it's very hard to figure out what's actually going on. Uh, so uh, Paul's with Jonathan, Jack Wimmin, uh, height, he actually figured it out. He was able to measure the coefficients of this large scale dynamo, and he found that it is consistent with the so-called alpha omega dynamo. I won't go into that, but it's really exciting. It's going to be the first time we've seen actual alpha dyna omega dynamo in action producing these vertical magnetic field lines uh, and producing this really powerful jets. See, the density is low. We'll call it a low density. These jets are highly magnetized, very light, and they can accelerate to relativistic velocities. The other thing that you see is that if we plot, so there are different plots versus time, I'm going to ask you to focus on this one, which is the ratio of jet power to accretion power uh, in percent. So 100% means that both are about the same. And that's actually a big deal, because that is a telltale uh, signature of this magnetically arrested disk state, which we now think uh, is behind a lot of astrophysical sources, like M87, infrared observation. Jet power of order of accretion power. P jet is of order m dot c squared. What's really mind-boggling is that we start without vertical field. The system wasn't supposed to produce any jet, and in fact, it managed to do the opposite and make the jet as strong as possible because you pretty much can't beat that. The jet can be stronger than the accretion flow. And so that is that shows us the jets are extremely resilient. Even if you take away the vertical field but give it another field orientation, it manages to survive just as well. Uh, there is a lot of other research going on on this type of simulations. Different graduate students and undergrads are working really hard to understand the properties of uh, turbulence, outflows, and so on, come and ask me questions. One of the really cool things that Beverly is working on, for instance, is that uh, these systems actually don't spin up black holes. They spin them down to nearly zero spin. So that might have something to do uh, with the sort of dichotomy. Um, if you have a state of accretion that is like this, it can bring black holes down to a halt as opposed to spinning them up. Uh, but maybe that's a bit of a too technical issue that I'm bringing up right now. What, what's the boundary conditions there? Because you must keep feeding it stuff. Ah, really good question. So uh, let me try to restart the movie. So uh, the boundary conditions are at 10 to the 5 gravitational radii, very far away. Ah. So really nothing happens there. They have no way of feeding. But there's lots of... There is, there is a lot of stuff. So I take a big donut that goes from here, which is like 10 gravitational radii, and ends uh, like in Jersey City, if Jersey City is in that direction. So it's, it's about uh, 50,000 gravitational radii in size. So it's about 1,000 times bigger than this. Okay. Okay. Probably not quite your city, right? 
Yeah. Wait, it's the other way. I'll go the other way. So rho is a density or field? Rho is density, uh, and color and is units? a Malov scale. What units? Sorry? What units? Oh, code units, very convenient, the dimensionless mm -hmm. units. Uh, so you can scale the simulations because they don't have any radiation in them. Uh, you can scale them up or down to your liking, as long as radiation is not important, uh, which typically works for either low luminosity systems or very high luminosity systems. In both cases, radiation can do much. But I'm going to show you results when radiation is actually important. And then the, the those curvy lines I thought were contour lines, but then right. you were talking about magnetic fields. This so is confused. contour lines of magnetic fields uh, in this vertical plane. So uh, like there is a loop of magnetic field, so it goes to the left and then back, so kind of counterclockwise. So you can think of it as, as a torus of magnetic field like this, everywhere around. This is just a vertical slice, but there are many other slices that I could show you. And so it, it means that we have the sort of uh, azimuthal torus of magnetic field where the field line is tracing out the donut. Does that? Oh. We can be just precise. What are these contour plots of? Uh, Axisymmetrized uh, A over phi, or magnetic flux function. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that helps because it's pretty technical. But it's a little <laughs> hard to understand Basic, you with your oh, math. Right. AL over phi? A lower phi. So it's uh, the, the covariant component of the vector potential okay. uh, of the magnetic field. Uh, but the way to think about it intuitively is if I were to take magnetic field structure and average it in phi, um, and then trace out, like take a point, and then move around following the field line, then it would go around in a circle like this. So following a field line in a vertical plane. This would be poloidal field lines if it was axisymmetric. This would be poloidal field lines if this were axisymmetric, exactly right. Yes. And these simulations are full 3D? Full 3D. Uh, actually, I didn't mention resolution is crazy high. This is unusual. Typical resolution is about 200 cubed. This is 2,000 times uh, 600 times 1,000. And that's part of the reason why we saw this for the first time, because you actually have to go to insane resolution compared to the stages. So can you tell us what's wrong with the simulations? Right? You are not pretending that this is some ultimate truth. There must be some cheating here, right? Because uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Andre. <laughs> no, but seriously, because like as recent as three years ago, for example, like I heard Stone this guy from Princeton, Jim or whatever, Jim, yeah, yeah. right, saying that even in a shearing box, they cannot quite saturate the dynamo. It depends on how long you run it and whatever. Yes. So there must be some cheating here, like the initial field or whatever. Well, the only cheating that I know of here is uh, it's a global simulation as opposed to a local simulation. In a local simulation, the vertical flux can change because uh, it's a periodic boundary condition. And, uh, and but, then, but the answer that we see does it depend on the initial condition? Uh, like if I feed if I feed a magnetic field which is a hundred times less energetic, will I get the same jet? Or not? Andre, I wish you were my PG advisor because it sounds like it's a lot of fun to work with you. Well, <laughs> student, no, well. Maybe, you, the you know what? Maybe I can come <laughs> to share like as my first sabbatical. See, I'm, look, I'm, I'm working. The, 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 like, I'm, I'm just kidding. So um, I don't know. And that's a really important question because here we start with a pretty strong magnetic field, uh, plasma beta of five, meaning that toroidal field energy density or pressure was 20% of gas pressure. Uh, any weaker than that, and we wouldn't be able to resolve the magnetorotational instability. So even at this high resolution, if we were to go lower, maybe this wouldn't work, or maybe this would work just as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is the first time we've ever seen anything like this. And uh, so now we have a lot of computational time, which we could use to try and actually answer these questions. So that's definitely something that we are working towards. Because, sorry, taking back your analogy with the sun, nobody gave the magnetic field to the sun. It created it all on their own, as witnessed by the 11-year cycle, right? It, it kills it and gives birth again. Uh, here, it's not quite the same. Anyway, so... Yeah, I. This is probably not the Let's right take place. this okay. offline. Yeah, I, yeah, okay, I fully okay. agree. This is this is super exciting. That's why we're trying to right. understand this. Uh, but no one knows the sensors. Even even in the sun, like in the stars. I thought I once. I think five years ago, I came out to conference and said, "Oh, we understand this in the stars," 
and like people are just like no, we don't. <laughs> so nobody understands this dynamo even in the stars. So and this is even newer. So there's a lot of things to do. Really good question. Okay. There were moments where the jets were asymmetric, top down, top yeah. bottom. Is that a does that mean that there's thrusts going on with the black hole? <laughs> you are asking really good questions. Hey, it's such a good audience. So uh, we think that this actually can be a big deal. Maybe not in galaxies, uh, but in collapsers, mm -hmm. uh, where the star collapses, yeah, forms right. a black hole, launches these two jets. If one of them is 10% more powerful than the other, the, the <laughs> thrust can actually just take the, nucleus out take the, the black hole out. Yeah, so it actually mm -hmm. can give strong kicks. It could be really interesting uh, for the LIGO measured um, misalignments of spins. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so we'd love to talk about this. Uh, and indeed, we find that there will be really strong kicks because these asymmetries will be there. So you might ask me, I was hoping that you would ask me, so Sasha, why was it that it was possible for you to run this simulation? Sure enough, people were there and they were trying to do the same thing. And part of this is uh, being in this field, we have to invest a lot of time not just into just running the thing, but also developing the code. And so uh, there is this awesome uh, researcher, Matt Tulishka, who I started working with as uh, he was a master's student. I was a postdoc at the time. Um, and he, uh, he took a code that everybody uses, uh, or a lot of people use in the, in the field called HARM. It doesn't mean anything bad. It stands for high-grade relativity in hydrodynamics. And he converted from, from CPUs on GPUs in two weeks. And that's just one thing he did. And then he did a lot of other exciting things that I will show you in, in just a second. The cool thing is that GPUs are much more powerful than CPUs because GPUs are dumb. Uh, they, 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 take, uh, they, they, they take it with the sheer force of computing as opposed to thinking really hard, which, which instruction do I go first for? So if you can adapt your code to run on, on GPUs and add features like adaptive meshes that can follow the small scale structures that you really care about, uh, you can do a lot of really cool science. And if you can get your hands on large uh, computing systems, uh, like uh, the GPU systems of the Department of Energy, um, you can win uh, maybe a few million uh, GPU hours, which costs a few million dollars. These are not cheap things. And I will show you some simulations that cost, literally one simulation was five million bucks. Okay. I mean, of course, I didn't pay myself, but the Department of Energy did. So it's really fascinating. But when you have a combination of really fast code and lots of computational time, thank you, DOE, uh, it's amazing. You can do really cool things. In fact, you can start thinking outside the box. You ask, what is the big question? And no, no longer worry whether it's doable or not, to degree uh, computation. And there is a lot of people working on this, grad students, undergrads, postdocs, and they're all cool. If you see the application, please consider them seriously, talk to me. I'm more than happy to, to share uh, any and all information about them. Um, so, so far we found that no matter what we do, vertical field, horizontal field, black hole manages to find a way to launch a jet. I'm not satisfied. I would like the jet to be not there because remember nine out of 10 systems don't have jets. So let's try to tilt the whole thing. Maybe it will break them finally. Okay, so let's tilt it. So this is a black hole with an axis vertical, disk tilted by 45 degrees, and these are surprise, surprise jets. Let's see what happens. See the, the black hole space-time is being dragged by the rotation of the black hole. That causes the disk to process around the black hole axis, and it takes the jets with it, which is really exciting because if you see as an observer a jet that's doing this on the sky, it might be reacting to these small scale uh, purely general relativistic effect of black hole frame drag. That's all I'm going to have the time to talk about here. I'm going to skip this. Uh, so the answer to the question you posed is it goes with the disk. It goes with the disk, not the black hole. It's a really good question. Yes. Jets tell you the direction of the disk angular momentum axis. So let's try this. Let's make the disk thin. Uh, so this is a, a simulation which is identical to the one that you saw before, except now the disk thickness, instead of being 0 0.3, now it's 0 0.03. And this is really hard. I, think, I don't think anyone outside of our group was able to go that thin with a tilted case. So here, it looks ridiculous. It doesn't even look like a disk. In 3D, it looks like this. So the disk is no longer one disk, but there are two. And these red things are jet. So let's take a look at the movie. So the disk is tilted by 65 degrees. Black hole axis is vertical. So the disk is tilted to the left. The jets are going uh, perpendicular to the disk mid plane. 
let's run the simulation. What happens is the black hole tries to cause the inner disk to recess, but it's connected to the outer disk. Uh, not sure what's getting us stuck. Let me go back. One second. Um, and uh, eventually, the disk is unable to hold onto the outer disk, and it tears off from the outer disk and continues doing its precession on its own. That's what happened here. Because the jets go out perpendicular to the disk, because the disk changes direction, the jets go with it, and now the jets can slam into the outer disk. That used to be part of one disk, now it's a separate disk. And the outer disk gets destroyed. So you can have the sort of AGN feedback right there in the central engine. Lots of collisions, uh, more disk tearing, we had one disk like this, second, third, fourth. It's crazy, it's insane, right? And like, imagine that you're trying to interpret an AGN observation when you think in your mind that it's a flat pancake with jets going out in both ways. It's nothing like that. So like, we're trying to now figure out what actually it will look like. All right, that's all I'm gonna talk, talk about here. Okay, so still jets, they still managed to make it up. What about this? This is our final straw that we're grasping. Maybe finally we're going to get these jets to not be there and have six minutes. Okay, so this is the $5 million simulation. Maybe it actually was, no, I think this one actually was $12 million simulation. Um, we took an allocation of like 5 million GB hours and it all went into one run. Imagine the amount of stress that Matthew was under, but he actually wasn't. He's like, yeah, it's fine. I understand how it works. So, okay, this is this that's really thin, 1 50th. So this is one and that is 50. And you will ask me, why Sasha do you care about thin disks? Because, well, the most luminous galaxies that have disks that are even thinner than this. So we really are approaching the real physical limit. These disks are extremely difficult to simulate because you have to resolve this tiny structure. We use adaptive meshes. It's really difficult because thin disks take forever to accrete, so you have to wait for a long time. And this also is tilted, which makes it completely insane. So if somebody told me 10 years ago that five years ago we would run this, no, three years ago we would run this, I would not believe you. I would just laugh you in the face. It's like, this is impossible. So in a sense, we are living in the future because had those GPUs didn't come, had they not come, we wouldn't be able to do this. And had Matthew not come, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, so what happens is we take a flat pancake disk tilted, the black hole warps the space time, and now the disk gets warped. Uh, but the, the same physics happens as before. One thing I totally forgot to tell you because I'm rushing is that one other big difference about the simulation is that now all of the field is toroidal. It's not a poloidal field. There is no vertical field here anymore. And you see one big result. Finally, there is no jet. Victory, no jet. Uh, but there are many other interesting things. Like you see these disks, they have all these wispy structures. They still tear up in, in different uh, pieces. The inner parts actually try to align with the black hole, which is a big deal, by the way. I didn't even, I even forgot to tell you that this result, this 45-year-old problem of whether the inner disks align with the black holes or not. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting physics going on, which I don't have the time to go into. What I'm going to want to show you is something else entirely exciting. So what if we add radiation to it? Because ultimately, we would like to understand what are the observational manifestations of this disk tearing. When the disk tears, it probably heats up. There's a lot of emission coming from there. Without radiation, we have no idea. And the previous simulation didn't have any radiation. We just cooled the disk to target thickness. Now we full, have full radiation transport on the fly with the feedback of, of photons on the structure of the flow. And uh, I apologize for the weird orientation. The disk rotates clockwise. That's just what happened, and I guess we need to redo it. But you see the same uh, sort of features happening, this tears, and then there is indeed a hot area. This is the temperature. Uh, this is emissivity. Uh, and this is if you take a disc flattened out as a pizza and, uh, and uh, look at it in x-ray, so you only get the column density, uh, that's what you get. So the disc is uniform in column density, but in temperature, it's not uniform. You see there is a very clear preferred direction, which is associated with the warp, where the disc heats up. I have never been taught that. That's really weird. So a grad student noticed that and thought, that's really weird. Let me look into that. And if you, if you make a cut like this in a circle and flatten it out, so you're looking at the meat uh, in azimuth, so this is phi and this is theta, uh, you see that the disk collapses twice per period and then bounces back up. So if I go around, this is what happens. Okay, I don't know about my audio. <laughs> accompaniment here. Uh, and there is a shock over here. And you can ask, 
Is it a big deal? Not a big deal. So this is probably the last thing I will be able to talk about here. So if I plot the effective viscosity that we measure in this disk, basically how fast the thing falls in, and it's normalized between zero and one. Typically value is like maybe between here and here, 10 minus two, 10 minus one. And you already see we have a problem because we have 10. How can something that can have a maximum value of one, which is what many of us thought, actually be at the value of 10? That's ridiculous. Something must be wrong. And so Nick has gone in, and by the way, he'll be on the job market in a couple of years. Please have a look I have for this guy. He's amazing. So uh, if we plot the magnetic stresses due to the magnetorotational instability, that's what we think causes viscosity. Uh, we get something that's more reasonable, a value of maybe a few percent, maybe 10%. So it's not magnetic effect, something else. Okay, let's try something else. What about Reynolds stress, the hydro stress? This is a magnet as this. We put in magnetic fields in there. We are hoping that they make a difference. And what we find is that all of the stresses are purely hydrodynamic. That is insane. And then uh, the regulation came here when uh, uh, Nick tried to estimate how much viscosity will be contributed to by these shocks, these shocks where the disc collapses. And they are lining up perfectly. So now, Nick and Matthew have discovered for the first time that a warp disk doesn't need magnetic fields to operate. That is fantastic. And the other really cool and mind-blowing thing I didn't have to put on the slide is that uh, these radiative disks, you would expect them to be uh, thermally unstable. Uh, it's, it's kind of a long story, but basically the disk undergoes a, a, a runaway cooling and collapses and, and you can't simulate anymore. These disks don't show this at all. If I were to flatten the disk and run the same simulation, it would collapse. So warp somehow makes the disk stable against this runaway. And that's what we see observationally. We see no indication at all that there is any uh, instability like that. So this shocks actually stabilize this disk against this runaway. So it's possible that now we have a way of causing this disk to accrete without any magnetic fields. And this way actually stabilizes the disk against this uh, radiative runaway. Presumably, so, that's a lot easier to simulate. Like, you could show well, that. No, basically, we can throw everything away and just say, hey, who has an SPH? No, but I mean, I, yeah, but, but, but that's what you're saying. You can just like ignore the magnetic field. You get a nice, stable accreting disk. We're not sure. We haven't actually done the simulation because in our code, if we switched off magnetic fields, uh, it would cost the same amount. The right, same cost. Of course. Because yes. uh, there would be no turbulence, <laughs> but we still need to resolve the thickness of the disk and so on. Yeah. But, you know, if you have an SPH code, uh, then. Uh, Andrew, have you expanded that page? No. Okay, well, so I don't know, but, but Andrew has very advanced codes with moving meshes, so maybe it will be easier for you to, to run these tilted disks. Anyway, we can talk about this, but we definitely wanted to try, take a code that only knows hydro uh, and, and see, do we have the same answer? Or maybe we will spend another $5 million. But not and, at and large distances, right? At large distances, your black hole disappears. And that's then... a really good point. And that's something else that, that's, a, that's well, this instability happens in like tens of gravitational radii, and that's exactly why the black hole still matters. So within a few hundred gravitational radii, we actually have stabilization. So in the places where most of the emission is coming from, uh, where most of the radiation is coming from, and where all of these processes are probably important, we we have this new so way of. Unfortunately, you cannot entirely drop magnetic fields. Uh, we're not sure. Maybe in this case we can. But not at large distances. Not at large distances. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But but here, where we see most of the radiation, maybe they don't really matter for dynamics, but they will probably matter for radiation. Okay. Wait, can I just? What is the the temperature? Is it, is is it your time or my time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I'm gonna take. What is the what is the temperature scale here? Blue is hot, right? I hope. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so red is hot. Red is hot. Blue, okay. Okay. Yellow, good. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So the disc. Go on collapses over here, and then adiabatic yeah. plus shock heats it up. And then as it goes through, uh, it expands, adiabatically cools, and also there is radiation that cools. Okay, okay, thanks. All right, so I think that I'm done because I am out of time. Oh, and there's also questions on the chat. Let me see. Oh, if sorry, I missed something that. else. Oh, uh, yeah, no, 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 you didn't miss anything. It's okay. fine. It's just the, the audio issue. And so let me, let me just skip to the very end. I missed a few things. Uh, I can t talk to you about just that fall apart. If you ask me a question, I can talk to you about gravitational waves. Uh, but this is the summary. Uh, no matter what you do, the jets seem to be out there 
except the two situations that we have identified. One is if you have a thin disk with azimuthal fields, no jet. If it's a thick disk, there are jets. And also, uh, if, well, I didn't have a chance to do this, but if the disk is going around in all sorts of directions, the jet, the jet doesn't know where to go, and so then it falls apart. Uh, this new, exciting, purely hydrodynamic way of transporting angular momentum and stabilizing against uh, the radiative uh, runaway cooling is, is really exciting. And uh, this is something I didn't have a chance to talk about, but there could be a new way for jets to generate their initial waves in collapsing stars. Thank you so much. I know it's time, so I, yeah, wouldn't, yeah. Be offended, I wouldn't be offended if you, if you get up and run. But there are questions. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, so you mentioned that 90% of jets are of. Um, Luminous uh, quasars luminous are jetless. Jet. Yeah. Uh, so do you understand why uh, that percent would not have that configuration set up that you found here? That is a really good question. That gives me an opening to show you some of the slides that I didn't have a chance to talk about. So uh, these quasars, they are big black holes. They're called quasars. Uh, but there are also things that are called microquasars, which have black holes a million times smaller, which are stellar mass black holes. And those have a million times shorter time scales, so we actually can observe them as we eat our lunch sandwich. Essentially, actually, time scales are about a week. And so, uh, depending on the luminosity uh, of the system, you can have different spectral states where the sort of thin disk approaches uh, the black hole from afar or all the way in, and the sort of dots show this puffy inner disk that's thick. So, that's the standard kind of picture thin disk at large radii, puffy disk at small radii. And so you're asking uh, why only 10% produce jets. So we think that in order to make a jet, uh, you have to be in this really weird transition from here all the way to there. Um, maybe it's too much to show here, but uh, if you plot luminosity here and hardness, meaning lots of hard x-rays at high luminosity, uh, at high energy, and this is very few, uh, these sort of state transitions in x-ray binaries, they, they take this Q shape. Uh, this is a letter Q. So a weak jets, stronger jets, uh, even stronger jets over here. That's what we're with. That's where I think most of these jetted quasars are. Uh, only about ten percent of quasars are caught in this state transition. Typically, it happens when uh, there is a lot of gas accumulated at large distances. Eventually, something causes all this gas to just rain down on the black hole, cause it to brighten up, launch these jets, uh, hang out there for ten percent of their lifetime, and then go back down. Why 10%? I have no idea. It's sort of large scale feeding. I would like to talk to people who actually simulate large scale feeding. Uh, but if I were to make an analog with these microquasars, that, that would be my understanding. And then once they hang out there, and once this sort of uh, large scale uh, jets powered by large scale magnetic fields, once they, they've lost the magnetic fields, because presumably there is a time scale for these fields to leak out, which had, no one has ever seen in a simulation, eventually the system calms down and comes here on the left where the disk is, is, uh, is thin, uh, and uh, there is no vertical magnetic field, uh, and there is no jet. Uh, so lots of poloidal field over here, powerful jet, no poloidal field over here, no jet. 90%, 10%. That's, that's the best of my understanding right now. In that explanation, would there be, like if you look at that Perseus cluster where there are these big bubbles are even better, uh, the, the really huge systems. Yeah. Um, would those bubbles outlast the the end points of the jet? Do we see massive clusters with bubbles but no jets? Uh, very and would rarely. That happen? Very would, rarely. Would you see it, or do the bubbles? I don't. I I just don't have the time scale. So, uh, but it feels like it would be very long time for the gas to mix back to. Uh, so if you well, we see bubbles on different scales. Yeah. So we see bubbles that were produced a long time ago, and we see new bubbles, and we see new jets. So we see this hierarchical scale. Uh, but so in, in the sense, the answer to your question is yes. Do we ever see bubbles that were recently produced, but the jet has switched off? I think there are a few cases. I talked to observers asking that exact question to them, and they answered that uh, the time scale for these bubbles to kind of dissipate, dissipate is comparable to um, the sort of the dynamical time scale mm -hmm. of the jet, maybe with an order magnitude. So if you don't see the jet, it's quite likely that you don't see the bubbles either. But there are some systems where you have this hierarchical structure, uh, old bubbles, newer bubbles, and very new bubbles with jets, where you kind of see what you are looking for. And 
in fact, you see that in M87. Uh, in Persis cluster, you also see that because you see this new jet changing orientation, but the bubbles are still out there. So yeah, there's no mystery. These things, we expect them to happen. They do happen. Okay. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, are those uh, gravitational waves uh, LIGO observable? Ah, that's a good question. So, um, because there was a paper, was it you, claiming that jets produce gravitational waves? Yep, exactly, right. Yeah, so the way it works is, uh, let me show you this movie first. So this is the center of a star. There's a black hole here. The star is fitting the black hole, and it produces these jets. And we're flying around it, so they just don't spin around like this. Uh, the jets are wobbly, and they can break apart. And that's kind of exciting in its own way, because if you look at the jet from different directions, uh, you actually can see multiple jets because this piece and that piece, they radiate in different directions. That's new. We didn't expect that. Typically, we think of a jet as a straight line pointing like a laser beam one way, but now we can have multiple laser beams. Okay, but what about gravitational waves? Uh, so if we ask what can potentially produce gravitational waves, it's this sort of structure that stirred up the star. We call it the cocoon. It's a combination of a shock, of these backflows, turbulence that comes with it. And so now, uh, if Wait, I have you shifted from Aegean jets to microquasars, where where are we? I'm like a little lost. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, the the question the that Andrea asked uh, is kind of oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. So we now switch to small scales. A star dies, uh, forms a stellar mass black hole in the center, which powers jets. And now, instead of a galaxy, these jets are breaking out of the star. But the physics is very similar. It's just the ambient profile is different. Uh, and, and this uh, all happens in a few seconds or so uh, a few minutes yeah a few minutes. Minutes. yeah okay. so uh the jet but can break out sorry into... sasha so it's not microquasars you are talking about it's the it's supernova yeah uh, yeah you can or call up our supernova because if it is supernova then people were talking about gravitational waves for supernovas well, for a this long is a time, supernova course, right? without a supernova because supernova typically requires an neutral star this is a black hole wait wait, wait sorry what it's, more like camera first. it's not a binary that's the point. Well, this could be in a binary, but, but then we, then we don't care then. about it. So we have we have a star, a uh, massive star, and its life, core collapses. And in our case, we consider core collapse into a black hole. Of this direction. So, or maybe it went through a transient phase of a neutron star, but it collapsed. Uh, yes, people consider gravitational waves from asymmetries in a neutron because star. God knows what will be the true... Um, but see, the, the, amplitude, the amplitude of those is very weak. So we want something that we can see from outside of, like from, from other galaxies. And so the exciting thing here is we have a jet that stirs up large scale structures. Those structures move mass. So there is a quadrupole moment associated with that, that, that produces gravitational waves. Uh, and so if you kind of plot the density of gravitational waves, this is what it looks like. So it's the sort of the, the bubble that the jets inflate that emits gravitational waves. How much mass is in that? Uh, uh, a fraction of a solar mass. Yeah. Where, where does all the, the mass come from? I would imagine, like at the end of the stellar evolution, like we'll just blow all the mass away. Uh, so the star is still there. The core collapsed. The rest of the star is unaware that the core collapsed, and the jet just goes through this, and uh, it injects a lot of energy. And this energy, like remember, it holds in the wall, splashes back because the head of the jet propagates much more, much more slowly than the the, the jet fluid. So the fluid hits the star, splashes back, and stirs everything up like crazy. So now there is a mixture of the jet material that's doing this, stellar material that's been shocked by the, by the jets, and everything is mixed together. And these sort of turbulent motions is what uh, creates asymmetries that can generate gravitational waves. So have we seen those already? LIGO is operational. LIGO 04 has been postponed, I think, until May. So it would be really exciting to try and catch these. Uh, there is there are there are there are two catches. One catch. So this is preliminary. Can like we we're we actually still refining how exactly to compute gravitational waves from a system from a simulation that doesn't know anything about, anything about gravitational waves. We don't have numerical relativity, so we actually have to look at actual changes in mass to compute that, include light travel time delays and so on. So these things can move up and down by a factor of two, I expect. Uh, but this is the spectrum of gravitational waves that so far we've been able to the best of our ability to compute. And this is the LIGO sensitivity curve. So they touch it as an R of 1. This is what distance? I mean, uh, this is for 200 megaparsecs. And pretty powerful source. So this is as good as it gets. Whether we will have such powerful events at this distance, it's, it's an open issue. 
uh, but it's exciting. Uh, we didn't expect this to be there, and it seems to be there. Um, and uh, we are now talking to uh, gravitational wave observers and to actual like transient observers to try and figure out can we combine uh, uh, observation of a supernova essentially or hypernova rather a jet powered explosion of a star to pinpoint the time and location and then go back in LIGO data and try and weed it out because this is white noise basically uh, I, I tried to play the, the the sound of this it sounds like shh essentially um, see it's flat spectrum so it, can we actually dig it out from the actual LIGO noise? We don't quite know. So we're just trying to figure out what it actually means for practical purposes. But it's probably there. The question is, oh, yeah, can there we is no it? template. That's There's there no template, template. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not an inspiral source, which sounds like whoop. And then sure enough, you actually have a template for this. Here's shh. And how many shh's are there? So I don't know. So if, yeah, and they use some local model for their noise that's it, yeah, it might <laughs> Which be. Which is based you on the data. Want to do it exactly. <laughs> What's the time, the length and time do you have? So that? our simulation is uh, what for this uh, was only three seconds long. I meant the, or, so the gravitational wave emission. Oh, gravitational wave emission will last for as long as the GRB lasts, uh, which is like minutes. Oh, seconds to minutes. It could be it could be seconds. We only simulated the first three seconds. I mean, I our simulation actually was much longer. But the thing is, in order to model something that is a kilohertz. You actually need to write out very, very frequently the data because we need to differentiate the time. <laughs> and that actually was like petabytes and petabytes of data. So we just simulated the first three seconds and then decided to compute this. So this is based on the first three seconds of the simulation. But we, we but you must be dominated by the quadrupole. Yeah, right? so you must there must be some the there must be some yeah. summary statistics. No, no, quadrupole that you would be down. long frequency. I so that is one of the issues that we refined because we had first used quadrupole and then yeah. uh, and then we like. Um, some smart people told us you can't do that. I'm like, damn it. So we went back and <laughs> we computed everything without quadruple. And the results are very similar. Uh, so that's why I'm saying preliminary. Uh, so it's still there. Um, and you know, the same questions apply. We'd like to understand what exactly can we do with this? Awesome. This is so awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody. There, there have been some coincidences. There have been coincidences. You can, he's right, here. With so you can, right? There have been never found anything. Right. The but, they're, is, but they're all probably further away than the that, and they're on axis. C on axis doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, so it would be better to do yeah. type C broadline or whatever exactly. the yep. thing yep. is yep. they yep. say, that's exactly and then push want. back to where it yes. should be. Exactly. Anyway, that's a yeah, good, that's a good you, project. I'm sure LIGO would be interested in doing time. that project. You can get MOUs. You know, if you have somebody who wants to do data, LIGO will sign an MOU with you, and you can do like the like search. Well, well, we do you. have uh, we do have LIGO people. So yeah, because you're at Sierra. Yeah, so there's LIGO people there. Yeah, yeah, and there are people who you guys built the first template search pipeline. I think it came from Sierra, didn't it? The first template search.